Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. I am really appreciative that I was able to be back and I would also like to thank my dad in case he happens to uh, pick this up later for filling in for me last week. I actually watched the recording and he did a really good job and uh, also covered a lot of material very quickly, which as you know is something that I struggle with. But uh, having had my dad as the teacher last week, you probably noticed a lot of similarities between the two of us. That's because he's the one that trained me. So if you did notice that, that was largely uh, the result of him being the one that actually taught me how to do a lot of this. Um, I've been in his Bible classes basically as long as I can remember. So uh, a lot of the stylistic choices that he and I both make come from the same school of thought. So we're going to go ahead and get into Hebrews this evening. And uh, we'd like to go ahead and apologize in advance if I sniffle a little bit. Uh, the pollen has gotten all of us, but I think it's hit me especially hard the past few days. But hopefully it won't be too big a deal. All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump directly into the text this evening. So we're going to be covering Hebrews 3, and uh, we'll go ahead and just start reading here. So we'll go ahead and read the first four verses. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus. He was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of the more glory than Moses, but just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. So, right off the bat, we can see from this verse that every single word has significance. So we're going to look into some of the significance of those words. First of all, what is Jesus called in this passage? High priest, that's one. There's another one. Apostle, good. So there are two titles that are given to Jesus in this passage, high priest and apostle. Now the more challenging question, why? Out of all the different titles, and we know that there's I believe, if I'm not mistaken, 117 different titles given to Jesus throughout the New Testament. Why did the Hebrew author choose these two at this particular time? Right, and that's a point that he's going to make a little bit later in this book. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but that's an excellent point to bring up, is that this is going to be a continuing theme throughout the book of Hebrews, is the idea that Jesus is the high priest. You may recall in the last couple of verses of the last chapter, this idea was introduced of Jesus being the high priest, the new high priest of the church, that he is our high priest in the same way that Aaron was the high priest of the Israelites. And so that's something that has already been addressed just a couple of verses before. So absolutely, that's an excellent explanation of that, that uh, this is going to be an idea that the Hebrew author is introducing, and he's going to kind of flesh it out a little bit here, but he's really going to flesh it out later. And so he's kind of introducing that idea. Anything else? Excellent points there. One thing that you've pointed out is there is a commonality in both of these titles. And that commonality is there's an extreme level of exclusivity. The priesthood is an exclusive title. And that's actually something that Brother, Brother Bob just spoke to is that there's an exclusivity of the high priest, that there is, uh, it, it's a high office, it's a high ideal. An apostle is the same way. So both of these things are exclusive. They are terms that the Christians reading the Hebrew letter would have been extremely familiar with. And that fits into the theme of Hebrews pretty well, doesn't it? Because the whole idea behind Hebrews is that Jesus is supreme. Jesus is greater than the law. Jesus is greater than the Old Testament. And so if that's the case, it would make sense to use names that are kind of lofty. Use titles that exemplify exactly what the Hebrew author is trying to communicate, which is Jesus is the ultimate. He is the supreme. He is over all. And so using these titles and titles of this caliber would give that kind of idea. So uh, one thing that kind of fleshes out one of the points that you made earlier with apostle and, and its rarity is that apostle means in the Greek, 
uh, apostolos, which is what it's derived from, one who is sent. And so it had come to, at this point in history, mean something very specific in the church because, of course, the apostles are a very small number of people. Uh, I believe there's only 16 people in the, the New Testament that are mentioned as apostles, so not a whole lot of uh, New Testament characters are noted as apostles. But what apostle means is one who is sent. And at this point in history, it had a sort of sister word in Hebrews. This was sort of the commonly accepted translation of the Hebrew word shalea. And what that means is sent with authority. And so you can kind of marry these two meanings in Greek and Hebrew. And of course, a largely Hebrew audience would have been familiar with this being sort of the companion word, the properly translated word from Hebrew. And there are some people that even speculate Hebrews was originally written in Hebrew. I happen to not be one of them. But there are some scholars that believe it may have even originally been written in Hebrew, and so it would have used the word shalea and then been translated into apostolos later. But regardless of, of your stance on that particular aspect of the scripture here, it's trying to convey the idea that Jesus is not only one that is sent, but he is one who is sent with authority. And so the idea that, honestly, we even kind of see a little bit in our modern day with people who are critical of Jesus. Well, you know, this Jesus guy, he had some really interesting ideas, and he was a really good man, and he was a wise teacher. You don't apply the term apostolos to somebody that was that. Because this means this isn't just a good guy. This isn't just somebody who is knowledgeable of the law. This is a person that was sent with an extremely specific mission directly from God with authority. That's what he's conveying when he's saying this to his audience. So let's look at another aspect of this passage of Scripture. Why bring up Moses at this point? What is the purpose of introducing Moses into the conversation at this point in his arguments about Jesus? Right, if you were making a Mount Rushmore of Old Testament characters, I mean, you probably have on there Abraham, Joseph, Moses, and then maybe one of the later prophets like Samuel, Elijah, somebody like that. But even though those would be considered great apostles, or great apostles, great prophets and people with authority, Moses is always held in the highest regard in terms of authority specifically. Because even though they held, for example, Abraham in very high regard, Abraham didn't receive a law. Abraham was a good person and a faithful person, but he's not a lawgiver. Likewise, all of the people that came after Moses, the prophets, the judges, so on and so forth, they may have very well been righteous people, and the Bible does sometimes portray them as such. However, they are all looking back to Moses. How does, for example, the kings, when we're looking through the books of history, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, how does the Bible gauge how good a king was? By how well he kept the law. And so even the great Bible figures that come after Moses are all derivative of did I keep the law of Moses? Did I not keep the law of Moses? That's how everyone is judged in the Old Testament after the Mosaic period. And so because of that, exactly what you're saying here is the reason that he would have brought up Moses here, at least one of the reasons, is that there is nobody that the Jews would have held in higher esteem or authority than Moses when looking to who is the person that tells us what to do and how to live in terms of being in a right relationship with God. If there's any Old Testament character that personifies that, it's definitely Moses. That's the person that they would have looked to to see, how do I live the way that God wants me to live? And so he's about to introduce this idea of, you like Moses, you hold him in high esteem, good. Jesus is better than Moses, and we'll get into that in just a second. Uh, what does he mean here by his analogy of the builder being more worthy of honor than the house. Okay, now that's something we've already addressed, so I think that's certainly what he's drawing on, is we've already seen the Hebrew writer talking about this idea of Jesus being involved in the creation. He is the one who creates the world, he creates nature, he creates mankind, and so there is some kind of call back to Jesus being an active part, in fact, the active part, of creation, him being the agent by which that is taking place. So I certainly think that's an aspect of it for sure. 
Any other thoughts on that? Right. I mean, that just makes logical sense to us, even if we weren't necessarily well-versed in, in Bible or, or well-versed in theology. It just makes sense what you're saying there, that the builder is going to have more honor than the house because there is no house without the builder. And so in the same sense, if there is no Jesus, there is no church. The church did not exist before Jesus. The church only existed as a reaction to the message that Jesus brought. And without Jesus, the church simply does not exist. And so that's another excellent example of what this means here. But if you look at what he's talking about here, being counted as more worthy than the builder of the house, more worthy of honor than the house itself, if you dive into what that means, I think one of the things and one of the ideas that he's trying to convey here is that if you look at Moses, Moses is a great historical figure. Any of us that have studied the Old Testament or its theology, and I mean, even from the time that we're very young, we understand the importance and the role of Moses to the children of Israel. We were just talking about that, but here's the thing. Moses, in every single instance of righteousness or good that he does, it's all pointing to God. That, that's an that's true of every single instance that Moses is brought in. He's saying, oh, you know, you have the burning bush. That's a big event in Moses' life. Why? Because God's there and he gives him a message. He gives him a mission. What about going to Egypt and telling the Pharaoh to let his people go? Okay, well, yeah, that's a tremendous Bible event, but that message didn't come from Moses. It came from God. And later on, when he brings down the Ten Commandments, he has rescued Israel from the clutches of Pharaoh and slavery. He didn't do that by his hand. He did it by God's hand. And then he brings down the Ten Commandments, which he didn't write, God wrote. And so there's this kind of idea that is underlied in the, the Old Testament, which Paul is kind of, or the Hebrew author, is bringing to fruition here, where he's saying, yes, Moses is extremely worthy of honor, but you're honoring Moses more than you're honoring the thing that Moses was trying to point you to. Moses is just the house. You have to look at who built the house, and he's about to make the case here that that indeed is Jesus Christ. That as important as Moses is, every single aspect of greatness that Moses embodied, it came from somebody else. That's not true with Jesus. Jesus isn't someone who just delivered the message. Jesus was the message. He was the word. And so when we understand that, we kind of get where the Hebrew author is leading here. So a few things that talk about the significance of Moses in the law. And uh, it may be worthy of note here just to remember that even though I wouldn't say that they're completely interchangeable, whenever somebody says Moses, that can almost be used as a synonym for the law. The law is Moses, Moses is the law. That's very common in New Testament vernacular. I wouldn't say that it's true in every single instance, but usually, especially when we're seeing dialogues between people, usually what's going on there is when they say Moses, they mean the law, and when they say the law, they can mean Moses, and so they could almost be used interchangeably. So Moses is mentioned in the New Testament more than any Old Testament figure, over 80 times. And so... Uh, more so even than, than David or any of the other great Old Testament figures. Moses is the one who lifts up the brass serpent. Now, you may recall this episode, and uh, we actually, I, I believe it was Paul that gave a lesson about this when we were partaking of the Lord's Supper just a couple weeks ago, talking about this episode where all of the fiery serpents go out into the children of Israel's camp, and they're being bitten, and this is a, uh, unfortunately... This is the result of their sin and their rebellion against God. And what does Moses do? He asks God to call the serpents off, and God responds, take up a brass serpent and put it up on a staff. And all those who look upon the brass serpent, they will be uh, protected from the fiery serpents. And so this is something that is done. Well, what do we see in John 3.14? Exactly what he was talking about in that lesson, that Jesus is also lifted up upon a cross and all those who look upon him will be protected from the venom of sin. And so there's a similarity that you could draw there. We also see that Moses prays for manna. And then we see in John 6, 31, that Jesus draws a parallel right there as well, that Jesus is the bread of life. And so there's a similarity between the two of them there. 
And then Moses also says, and this is a direct quotation from Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among you from your countrymen. To him shall you listen. And that, again, happens in Deuteronomy 18.15, and then it is directly cited as being a prophecy about Jesus in Acts 3.22, and then later in Acts 7.37 in Stephen's sermon. And both Moses and Jesus face rejection from their people, and so that's another commonality that they have there. And this brings me to the point that I've already touched on a little bit. Moses is the bringer of the law, but Jesus is the law. He is the word personified. And that brings me back to my first two points here. See, Moses is the one who lifts up the brass serpent. Jesus says, I am the brass serpent. Moses is the one who brings bread from heaven and prays for manna. But who is the bread from heaven? It's Jesus. And so this is the point that he's making here by drawing on the illustration of Moses. He's saying, everything that Moses was, as great as it is, it's all just pointing to Jesus. You want to go back to Moses? You can't go back to Moses without arriving at Jesus. There is no means of escape. If you love Moses, you will love Jesus because Jesus is the thing that Moses was always pointing to. And that's the purpose of him quoting this passage of Scripture directly uh, that we see from Deuteronomy 15, uh, eighteen fifteen, that God is going to raise up a prophet. Well, that prophet was Jesus. That's who he was talking about. And so everything that Moses did, his life's work, his bringing of the law, it was all building up to Jesus coming and being with mankind in the flesh. So let's go ahead and look at the next few verses in Hebrews 3, verses 5 and 6. Now Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold firmly to our confidence and the boast of our hope. So we first saw him making this analogy of the house not being as worthy of honor as the person who actually built the house. Now we're going to see a second comparison to why Jesus is superior to Moses, which is Moses was a great ser servant. He was as good a servant as you could ask for. However, Jesus isn't just a servant. He's the son. So if we're talking about household structure, and this is something that may be slightly foreign to us as modern people who typically don't have slaves, which, of course, is a good thing, but this is something that they would have been familiar with, this sort of household structure. You know, there were servants that were so trusted by their masters and so beloved by them that they were treated as family. But no matter how well they were treated, how much they were respected, how well they were thought of by both their masters and the community, it's still not the same as being a son. It's still not the same as being the heir to that. If the father of a family, the patriarch, dies, does the slave take over? No, the son takes over. And that's the point. Jesus is vested with greater authority than the servant ever was. And so this is what he's trying to point out here. And then we're going to see him quote uh, some scripture here, because we see right here he's talking about him being a faithful son over the house. So let's go ahead and look at Numbers chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. And uh, by the way, just to give you a little bit of background on this story, this is the story you may remember where Moses is having a little bit of a tiff with Aaron and Miriam. They have a problem with him marrying a, a darker-skinned woman, and this causes a little bit of a family squabble. And then Aaron and Miriam are very upset with him. And so this is God's response to Aaron and Miriam. So in Numbers 12, 6 through 8, he said, this is God speaking, Now hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him in a dream. It is not this way for my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, that is, openly, and not using mysterious language. And he beholds the form of the Lord. So why are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Now this is pretty fascinating. Because you'll notice that in a sort of subtle way, the Hebrew writer is referencing this passage. 
Because he says he's a servant over all the household. He is a faithful servant. That's what Moses is. And he's drawing directly from this passage in Numbers where the Lord ascribes to Moses his faithfulness. And this happens at a time, interestingly enough, where God is speaking to Aaron and Miriam. Do you see the level of intimacy that is being described by God here? Moses isn't somebody that I just send visions to occasionally, or uh, he's somebody that I make known to him when he's dreaming, that kind of thing. No, I speak to Moses mouth to mouth. That was the kind of relationship God had with Moses. And yet, the relationship that God has with the Son is even greater than that. Because as great as Moses was, did Moses ever claim to be one with God? Did Moses ever claim to, whenever Moses spoke, it was the same as God speaking the way Jesus does? No, he never does that. He never claims that he is of the Father and that he came from heaven. None of that is true of Moses. And so the thing that the Hebrew author is calling upon here by referencing this verse is he's calling to their attention that even with that level of intimacy that Moses had with God, it's nowhere close to the intimacy that God has with Jesus Christ. And it's also interesting, I think, that Moses is like his siblings and yet unlike his siblings. Is it true that Miriam and Aaron sometimes prophesied for God? Yes, that is absolutely true. And it's also true that Aaron, you remember early on in Moses' ministry, was basically the spokesperson for Moses because Moses didn't have a lot of confidence in his speaking ability. And so because of that, you remember that the actual words that are used in the scripture there is, I will make Aaron like a prophet and you his God. And so God elevates Moses and says, you're going to be the person that I give the words to say to, and then you're going to speak them to, to Aaron, and Aaron is going to be like a prophet for you. And so there's a similarity between Moses and Aaron, but it's not the same. And that's what God is pointing out in this passage. And in the same way, the Hebrew author later is saying, yes, there are similarities between Jesus and Moses. Jesus is like, you know, other prophets that have come before him, but he's also very different. There is a level of intimacy between him and God that does not exist between the others. And that's the kind of idea that he is calling upon here. So let's look at Numbers 20, verses 9 through 12. So Moses took the staff from before the Lord, just as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly in front of the rock. And he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Since you did not trust in me to treat me as holy in the sight of Israel, for that reason you will not bring this assembly into the land which I have given to them. So we're all familiar with this story. This is the reason that Moses is not permitted to lead the Israelites into the promised land because he disobeys God. So I think that the key point that I'd like to bring out here is what does God mean in this passage by saying that Moses did not treat him as holy? Exactly. And so this is the contrast that he's trying to draw here that I, I just sort of briefly mentioned. And for those of you who may not have, have heard Doug or those listening online, what he was saying is the reason that this is not treating God as holy is because he put himself on equal footing with God. He says, are we going to bring water? And so what's going on here is that to be holy means to be sanctified, set apart. There is an otherness to God that is different from us. And Moses didn't recognize that here. He treated God as an equal. So even though there is a great deal of intimacy between Moses and God, and he, God speaks to that sometimes in Scripture, that's not the same as him being the same as God. In fact, the sin that Moses is most known for, the biggest mistake that we have recorded of him in Scripture is putting himself on God's level. Now, what happens when Jesus puts himself on God's level? He's glorified. He's not punished. And the reason for that is because that is Jesus' rightful place. 
Moses exceeded his office as a prophet. He went too far. Jesus cannot possibly go too far because he is everything that God is. And that is the point that the Hebrew author is making by bringing this idea up. So let's go ahead and read the next few verses of Hebrews 3. We'll look at verses 7 through 11. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as on the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my anger, they certainly shall not enter my rest. So for those of you who don't know, you can see there that this is a quotation. This is a partial quotation of Psalm 95. And as I have mentioned earlier in some of my previous lessons, that when you are talking about a psalm, whenever the Hebrew writer is referencing a psalm, he's not just referencing the lines that he writes, he's also referencing the entirety of the psalm. And so this isn't a very long one, it's pretty quick. So we'll go ahead and read Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with a song of thanksgiving. Let's shout joyfully to him in song with instruments. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hands are the depths of the earth, and the peaks of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test, they tested me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I was disgusted with that generation and said, they are a people who err in their hearts and they do not know my ways. Therefore, I swore in my anger, they certainly shall not enter my rest. Hmm. Do not harden your hearts as those at Meribah. Didn't we just read about the incident that happened at Meribah with Moses striking the rock? And so it's just amazing to me the level of biblical scholarship that the Hebrew author possesses and shows off is that he's drawing these rhetorical connections between the things that he's referencing. First, he mentions the event and sort of brings in the symbolism of the event of what happened at Meribah into his lesson, and then immediately after references Psalm 95, which is a direct reference back to what happened at Meribah, and he's telling his readers, don't harden your hearts as Moses did. In other words, Moses made the mistake of treating himself as being on par with God and not having to obey his words. And a rejection of Jesus Christ, which is the heresy that is being dealt with in the book of Hebrews, is exactly the same thing. It is treating God as not holy. And so to reject Christ is to reject the holiness of God. You want to go back to the old law? You can't go back to the old law and treat God holy once Jesus Christ has come. The Son is here. That is no longer an option. He has left you no room for escape. He's really imploring them not to repeat the same mistake of Moses or the children of Israel. So it's not just the mistake that Moses had. You see later on in the same psalm that gets quoted in Hebrews. is It's also about the people there, the children of Israel that are at Meribah and their rebellion. See, Moses was actually right to be upset at their rebellion. That was an accurate and justified anger. It's just his reaction to it was wrong. And so the rebellion that they have was really the key issue here. So I think that the logical next question is, what was the Israelites' big sin? Why were they in trouble with God at this point in, in Israelite history that the Hebrew author is referencing? That's exactly right. They were worshiping idols. It's idolatry. This was the sin that propelled them to not obey God as it always does. And so it's interesting. We just saw 
an analogy given in Hebrews about the house not being as important or as worthy of honor as the person who brought the house, the person who built the house. And in the same way, we see similar metaphors being launched here that Moses, who is the bringer of the law, is not superior to the thing that he was pointing to. That Moses' greatness is derivative of God's greatness. What is idolatry when you boil it down to its barest essentials? It is worshiping the created thing rather than the creator. It's worshiping the sun or rivers or plants or whatever else it is. Um, so when you worship the thing that is created rather than the creator, you are committing a sin. And in the same way, the point that the Hebrew author is trying to convey to these people is you have made the mistake of worshiping the law. Now, the law is good. The law is from God. The law has a lot to say to us and instruct us. But the law isn't God. And if we fall into the trap of worshiping the law, then we have made the law itself an idol. We have made Moses, the bringer of the law, an idol. As good as the law is, it's not God. But you know what is God? Jesus is. And so this is the point that he's trying to make is, you guys are so caught up in this idea of wanting to romanticize the law and romanticize Moses that you've missed the point that all the things that the law and Moses were building up to was Jesus. You've completely missed the point. And now you're doing the same thing that the ancient children of Israel were doing, which is worshiping the created thing as opposed to the creator. And so this is the point that he's tr really trying to make and drive home here is he's trying to say, you guys are falling into the same er error that they did thousands of years ago when they started worshiping things that were not God. So let's go ahead and look at the next few verses. Hebrews 3, 12 through 13. Take care, brothers and sisters, that there will not be any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another every day, as long as it will still be called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. First of all, when looking at this passage, I think it's significant to bring up. This is the second time in a very short amount of time that he has brought up this familial language. So he's saying, brothers and sisters. Why would he do that? I think it's pretty obvious what he's getting at here. He's trying to, just like when maybe you're trying to convince a family member to either do a favor for you or trying to steer them away from something you feel is destructive, you say, look, brother, look, sister, you know, you're, you're prefacing it that way because you're trying to convey that this is an important thing and also that you're coming at it from a place of affection. And so... Again, I know that technically we don't know that Paul was the author, but this is a very Pauline thing to do, and we see this in his other letters, so I think this may be an indication that it was Paul, that, that Paul constantly sort of does this back and forth where even when he's just excoriating somebody on a sin or a heresy that they need to get out of, he'll couch it in familial language and amicable language. And this is done to make the argument more palatable. But this concept that he's talking about here, where he says to encourage one another and build one another up while it is still called today, it reminds me very much of a C.S. Lewis quote uh, that I had uh, read at one point where it says that uh, there are so many people that make the mistake of wanting God to transform them tomorrow that, okay, God, I really want you to help me get rid of this sin in my life, but, you know, at some later point. And Paul is saying, don't wait around, don't put this on the back burner. You need to encourage one another now to prevent sin from taking effect, to prevent sin from sort of ensconching itself into your heart and causing problems for you later. And so that's why he's talking about the deceitfulness of sin, which 
many times convinces us that we can put off this transformation, this getting sin out of our life until a later date. And, and the sin, of course, that he's talking about right now is a rejection of Christ. And so he's saying, encourage one another that you do not fall into that problem. So let's go ahead and read verses 14 through 17. Yes, sir. No, I think that that's actually an excellent point because God would have been totally justified and righteous in saying, here's the new law, y'all deal with it. But he didn't do that. He actually gives us a book to help with that transition and make it easier for us. And I think that that's a, a great point to bring up. Um, so let's go ahead and read the next few verses as we wind down here tonight. For we have become partakers of Christ if we keep the beginning of our commitment firm until the end. While it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard him? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose dead bodies fell in the wilderness? Now, nobody can read this in my mind and think that a fall from grace is completely impossible. I, I, it just does not register with me how anyone can read this passage of Scripture and go, oh yeah, once saved, always saved. Just totally. I, I'm sorry, I don't see how anyone can read that and get that out of that verse. Uh, he's addressing people who have already been saved, who are Christians, and he's saying, I'm encouraging you to stay away from sin, and like we saw in the last verse, the deceitfulness of sin, um, because I, you have become partakers in Christ, and the way that you preserve that promise is to the end. When he's talking about the people who are the dead bodies out in the wilderness, by the way, that's a direct reference to Numbers 14, 28 through 32, which we don't have time to get into. Uh, but that is a direct reference to those who were left in the wilderness to die because they were not faithful to God. And that was God's fault, right? No. God gave judgment to them, but he gave them the opportunity to enter the promised land. He said, at Sinai, if you keep my promises, if you keep my statutes, if you do all of the things that I've told you to do, I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey. And they said, yep, we agree. That's a good deal. We will take that deal. And then five minutes later, they're building the golden calf. I mean, it is astonishing how fast they broke that covenant and then continued to break it over and over and over again throughout the events of the Pentateuch. And so what is trying to be emphasized here that the Hebrew author is bringing to their attention is it's not enough to make a commitment at the beginning. It's good that you have obeyed the gospel and put on Christ in baptism. Those are good things. But you have to endure to the end just like the children of Israel did. And if you refuse to do that, you will meet the same fate that they did. You are going to fall prey to the same problems that they did. And so there's this constant analogy that is going on throughout this entire chapter between those two forces, between the mistakes of Moses and the mistakes of the children of Israel and the people he's addressing. So we'll read the last two verses here very quickly. Hebrews 3, 18 through 19. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. And this just reinforces my, my previous point that uh, those who were dead out in the wilderness, they were there of their own accord. They chose to disobey God and they suffered the consequences because of it. And the point that he is bringing up here is you are no better than the ancient Israelites. If you disobey God, if you go away from his appointed prophet, in Israel's time, Moses, now his son, Jesus Christ, you will be left outside of the kingdom just like they were. And so do the best that you can to encourage one another to avoid that fate. And the irony in all of this that he's been building up is a quote-unquote return to Moses and a return to the law would actually be a betrayal of Moses and a betrayal of the law because Jesus is everything that Moses and the children of Israel were not. So thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos.
Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.